All right, folks, uh, the next session that we have coming up is uh, a look at the ASIO Security 2025 Future Security Trends and Considerations. I'm going to invite uh, Brian DeCares and Dr. Gav Schneider uh, to join me on screen as we as we have a bit of a conversation about this. By way of introduction, uh, Brian DeCares is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Security Industry Association Limited, or ASIO. Uh, Brian uh, has over 25 years of senior management experience across a range of industry sectors. He did start his early career as a senior editor with a global finance and business publisher based in London, moved to Australia in 1990 to take up a position as general manager. He joined ASIL in 2000 and was appointed CEO in 2006. He's helped guide the association through a period of growth and significant change, including overseeing registration as a federal employer organization and consolidation as the peak body for security professionals. He has participated on a variety of Australian standards committees, security industry councils and liaison groups. And of course, he'll be joined by Dr. Gav Schneider, CEO of Risk2 Solution Group. Dr. Gav is the group CEO and is an acknowledged subject matter expert on human centric and integrated risk management. He has a broad background in safety and security, emergency management and incident response with extensive senior level management and leadership experience. He's led numerous high level consulting and advisory projects and has two decades of operational specialized risk management, culture change, security and safety experience in over 16 countries. Dr. Gav is considered Australia's leader in the field of psychology of risk. and He was also led the research team for the ASRC for this very important project. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Thanks, Joe. Well, fir firstly, congratulations on a really robust and interesting report. It's, uh, it's something that I think we probably all agree, anyone who's, who's uh, been part of the, the private security industry and or has a connection to the private security industry is very grateful for. Uh, because it's something I think we've all speculated on, but it's it's great to have it in black and white. Thank you. Uh, Brian, if I, could, if I could just uh, start off by way of introduction before I get to the prepared questions. Uh, what, what was the impetus behind the report? What, what was the what was ASIL's uh, aim and hope to achieve with this? Well, the objective when we set out was basically to establish some of the challenges, trends and opportunities facing the industry uh, and reflect on I suppose where the industry is at today and where it needs to be by 2025. So I think in doing the report, we wanted to recognize obviously the contribution that the industry makes to the, the economy, but also try and establish a roadmap of what are some of the improvements that need to be made to, to build the capability and capacity of the industry. Absolutely. So Gav, uh, to, to set the scene, what did the research process actually look like? Um, we try to be as robust as we could, Joe. So, you know, I'm pleased to say at this stage, it's certainly the largest study that's been done into the security industry in Australia to date. And it included uh, two, two surveys, one that went out to providers of security and one that went to users of security. And we got hundreds of responses back from those. We ran roughly seven focus group sessions, which included regulators, government agencies, small businesses, medium businesses, large businesses, and a bunch of other SMEs. We also conducted 18 individual interviews and did a robust literature review. So part of the challenge with such a robust research process was consolidating that into something workable. And uh, that, that part I have to really credit my colleague, Dr. Paul Johnston, who helped us synthesize and pull all those pieces together in a way that we believe is gonna be useful. And as we, I guess progress with this session and talk about some of the findings and some of the thoughts that came out of this project. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say we were we achieved something pretty tough. Nobody's got a you know ability to forecast the future with 100% certainty, but I think we were able to predict with a fair level of confidence what some of the key trends are and what we need to be doing to get ready. Absolutely, and the, the academic rigor that's applied to that is uh, is something that that is incredibly important. Obviously, the reason that ASIO commissioned the Australian Security Research Centre to do the report. Uh, so let, let's talk about some of the findings. Uh, Brian, I'll throw to you first. What what are some of the key findings that that uh, were of interest to you? Well, I think probably the 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 the, the big picture finding really is that it's uh, it's a shared responsibility. We we all need to work together on this. Obviously, the industry in terms of security providers. Uh, government, uh, regulators, as well as end users, so customers. So we need to uh, come together to actually achieve some of the objectives that we need to to over to, to get to the aims that we want to get to. We need to overcome a number of challenges, and 
in isolation, we will not achieve that. So we do need to collaborate a lot more closely between not just at a state level, but a, a federal level as well to make sure we actually get uh, that capability and capacity that we need for the future. Because at the moment we are we're on a bit of a holding pattern where we cannot progress until we get that leadership. Absolutely. And, and Gav, for you? There were so many, but I'm going to segue off uh, what Ambassador Noble was talking about and some of the challenges with the terrorist landscape. You know, there, there's no doubt that when we look at the fact that the security industry is larger than all our law enforcement agencies and our defense force combined, that in tackling evolving threats like terrorism, we have to learn to leverage our industry better and engage it more effectively. And it plays a critical role in national security, arguably a role that is not necessarily um, understood or celebrated or leveraged as effectively as it could be. Um, there were other pieces also around just the adaptability, agility, and the way the industry is able to respond so quickly. And COVID was a great example of that, where you know, while there might have been a little bit of negative exposure based on the quarantine hotel debacle that happened in Victoria, after the inquiry, it was quite clear that that was probably not the fault of the security industry. And we didn't really get you know, the good news of how the security sector really secured most other hotels, stroke, other quarantine facilities around the country with almost no breaches and no issues. So I think you know, there are many pieces that did come out of the study, but you know, the, the, the role the industry plays, the contribution it has to the national economy, national security, are really underrated aspects. You know, we estimated that the sector brings in around $11 billion. But if we were really to be uh, robust about the way we report on that, there are so many interdependent sectors, such as the aviation sector, passenger transport sector, event sector, um, the list kind of goes on, that couldn't function without the security industry. So, you know, technically we could actually bolt on all of their revenue too, because they can't function without the security industry. So I, th I think there's a lot to talk about there, and I know we're going to get onto some of the specific findings shortly. Um, but just to echo Brian's comment, it was fascinating to see some of the convergence pieces coming together. And as an example, it was no surprise that there was a lot of frustration from providers of security around state-based regulation and the fact that you know individuals in each state need to have their own license, the companies need to have their own license, and despite uh, I guess, to be honest, a facade of mutual recognition, it doesn't work really well. What was an interesting finding for us in the, re in the research was that this is a frustrating point for the users of security too, not just for the providers of security. And that, that they actually are finding it quite tough because of the inconsistency of regulation and the differing standards. So it's kind of interesting that this was one of the first opportunities we had to look at really different perspectives. And, you know, we had we had regulators involved, too, and they don't have an easy job either. And there's a lot of historical legacy for regulators and change is tough to do. But one of the primary drivers is that we want to actually move towards what good looks like. And I think that's probably the biggest outcome is we now actually have a picture and an articulation of what a great industry would look like. And while it might be difficult to achieve, at least we have a platform to work towards. And if I might, I can might just add to that what uh, Ambassador oh, said was, I mean, one of the key uh, takeouts from the report is that the issue of you know, digitization is is building up momentum within security. So you've got you know artificial intelligence, video analytics, uh, the use of robotics. There's a whole range of uh, uh, of systems that will be coming progressively more prevalent in the industry. Uh, and we need to be ready for that and to embrace those technological innovations. Um, and some of the other areas, uh, which I mean, a position we've had for 25 years is, you know, having nationally consistent security licensing standards. We still have a patchwork of, of regulatory regimes across the country, which creates vulnerabilities, which um, government is well aware of, but at a, at a state and federal level. But we we seem to get closer. I think 2008-9 COAG was 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 prepared to to push for more consistent national uh, licensing, but it, it fell over. Um, we would like to see that you know come to fruition sooner rather than later because it's in the interest of the 
of the national economy as a whole, that we we have that one standard, uh, professional standard across this industry because as an industry, we're going to play a greater role. It's uh, We've seen that through throughout the, the COVID pandemic that, you know, we have the crisis and security is expected to be there to turn on the tap when people need it. Uh, for different services, they had to pivot very quickly, provide different uh, technology solutions, different protective security solutions. Um, but we need to prepare that capability. And obviously, we've got different uh, security threats that we now face. Uh, we want to be able to have an industry that is responsive to the needs of government, corporates, uh, domestic clients. Uh, and I think we're going to we we need to prepare now for the future, not wait till the future gets there. Uh, absolutely, couldn't, couldn't agree with that more. And, and that's where a, a good segue into the next question is uh, specifically what aspects uh, of this report affect layers of government uh, being federal, state or local? Uh, Gab, do you want to field that one first? Sure. Um, just noting that it is a 100 page report with many, many uh, diverse findings in it. We probably won't be able to get through everything in this session, but let's start first at federal. And I, I think one of the things that was quite clear is the role the security industry has to play in numerous aspects, whether it's crisis or emergency response, whether it's potentially the, the role that the private security industry plays in protect, protecting critical infrastructure, uh, or whether it's cyber security, uh, many machinations, whether it's the on extended supply chain or whether it's directly for government itself, most of those solutions are actually provided through private security. And it's an interesting piece that while the protective security policy framework used by federal government agencies is an excellent framework, it's now being extended to the idea that suppliers to government need to also adopt this framework and professionalize the way we do it. So I think, that, you know, in summary, there's a lot of great things that private sector does. There's a lot of good things that government does, but they need to integrate. Probably the key one for federal was our recommendation for the establishment of a security industry coordination office under the home affairs portfolio, primarily because of what Brian just highlighted. And uh, his term patchwork is a really good descriptor. And uh, I, I, I really do feel for Brian and his team who've been, you know, for decades now championing the cause of, you know, some some level of consistency. But it does seem that without some sort of national push from a federal level to make this happen, it will be very hard to achieve. It's also in the interests of national security to have unified standards and perspectives. For example, uh, in the UK, Project Griffin, which leveraged the private security industry for counterterrorism initiatives, would be almost impossible to roll out without some sort of federal overarching structure. Um, if we go down to state level, uh, you know, again, a lot of state governments own many assets and use private security offices. They use CCTV surveillance, they use access control, they use cyber security professionals. And not every state has adopted a protective security policy framework, nor necessarily have matured the relationships and the way they engage with the security industry. And it was quite interesting that it was at the state and local government levels where a lot of suppliers brought up uh, what has become you know, quite well known as the race to the bottom, where even though we have quite well structured award rates and the industry has minimum pay scales, you still see many state and local government agencies awarding contracts based on lowest price as opposed to compliance stroke best product, best value. So I think there's a big piece there. Uh, there's also the other piece around, you know, within the PSPF federally, it's, it states that each agency and department needs to have a chief security officer. We don't necessarily this, see that trend rolling down yet into states and into local governments. And that, that's a trend that we would think would need to follow. And that comes into the upskilling, professionalization and development of the way we tackle security risk in general. And we really do need to find a balance here because there is there is really robust examples of what good looks like and we need to leverage off those and then probably the the last layer looking at local government a lot of local government um, councils actually have their own protective security officers as do state government agencies and really they are somewhere in between you know a sworn law enforcement officer and a private security officer but for the most part all the trends identified in the study are relevant to any agency that has their own protective security officers. 
So I'd be urging them to get hold of the report and actually look at what those future trends, forecasts and things that can be done mean for them. I could go on, but uh, I think that, that sort of provides a bit of a, an overview. Yeah, from an initial point of view, I think the I think certainly from the federal level, we'd like to see more leadership in terms of driving this uh, push to get some nationally consistent standards. From a state level, we need to to get the states to put aside parochial differences and actually get uh, agreement on what what you know what should be consistent. Uh, you know, we have the anomaly where a student visa holder in some states can get a license and stand outside a bit of critical infrastructure, whereas in other states they they're not able to, and we support the fact that you need to be a you know permanent resident, a citizen of the country, you know, to do these jobs because they're important jobs. And at a at a local level, uh, we'd like to see greater efficacy and uh, ethics in terms of procurement practices because uh, we've got to value quality. Uh, at the moment, there seems to be uh, too much pressure being put to, on price uh, and keeping prices as low as possible, which will not improve standards. So, in the long run, that will lead to uh, more and more problems. So we, we really want to see a, 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 a tri, tripartite approach where all levels of government, you know, agree on what what look, you know what they want to achieve. But I think the industry as a whole wants to to professionalise, wants to improve. But obviously, you know, good might come at a slightly more higher price than mediocre. So we need to get that culture shift and maybe a paradigm shift in the, the way that security is looked as a as just a dead a dead cost that you don't really want to have to pay. So you'll be like insurance, you'll pay as little as you can and hopefully it doesn't, you know, doesn't go wrong. Uh, but we think you need to have a slightly different uh, different approach to how you look at security. Um, Joe, and maybe segueing on from what Brian just mentioned there, uh, if we look at, you know, both um, Minister Andrews and uh, Ambassador Sinodinus's opening remarks, and we, we overlay that with what Roger Noble was talking about, you know, the, the real challenge we, we face is sometimes, you know, if you go too conservative or you don't understand or you don't apply best practice, it could be too late in the case of a serious incident. And if we look at the increase in cyber threats, we look at the increase in you know, possible um, violent extremism and all of those pieces that we know are coming, you know, I think there's a duty of care responsibility on all users of any security service to be thinking about what is the risk they're actually managing and are they applying that in a meaningful way? And I think there were quite a few findings that came out of the report to support that piece. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so some excellent takeaways there. Um, the next question is, uh, what are the actions that various stakeholders need to consider to help us achieve the stated and desired outcomes? Uh, Brian, I'll go to you first on this one. Uh, well, I suppose uh, one of the challenges for us as an association is obviously the we need to reframe the perception of security. There's a, a somewhat outdated view of security, which is uh, very much, you know, around the the, the bouncer. Uh, the security is so much more than that, and that's a very small sector of the industry. So I think we have a we have a challenge for ourselves to basically reframe how security is perceived, uh, because it is actually uh, you know there's 155,000 licensed security personnel around the country working at you know defence bases, critical infrastructure, aviation shopping centres, uh, distribution centres, uh, supermarkets. So it's a fundamental part of uh, most organisations operations. So, um, but I think we also need to to promote you know, security as a career of choice. Uh, we need to upskill the personnel uh, because the, the, the personnel of the future will need different skills to what they need now. Um, and I think what we need to do is, as an industry is probably embrace uh, some of the technological changes that are happening uh, in, in in greater uh, greater efforts across all the industry to actually embrace that technology. So um, certainly uh, industry standards, we've, we've been long involved in that. We've got to keep pushing those up. Um, but it, I think it's a range of, it's it's not just a one size fits all. We need to do a lot of different things to, to nurture the industry so it is actually capable uh, because it will be, um, I think we will be doing different things in the future. So I mean, an example is obviously COVID. Um, but you know the 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 shifting geopolitical environment in the region. You know we we already had some initial discussions with the um, the general defence uh, mobilisation directorate about potential roles for security moving forward. Uh, so we need to start thinking now of how do we upskill our staff? How do we get you know the the skill sets in there to be able to meet the future needs of not just government but the corporate sector as well. 
Absolutely. And uh, just before I throw to you, Gav, for, for your response to that question, I would just like to encourage any attendees, if you have questions for Brian or Gav uh, in relation to this report of the future of the industry, do feel free to use the Q&A box to submit those questions and uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Gav, over to you for your response to the actions the stakeholders uh, need to consider. Thanks. I'm not going to repeat the ones Brian mentioned, but I, I do definitely want to support his uh, opening comments there around the image of the industry, the way we look at, you know, the way federal government, state governments, etc. use the industry, the need for the industry itself to start having a unified voice. And, and that was one of the, the other interesting pieces that did come out of the research that traditionally the RCT sector has dominated the cybersecurity landscape, but we're seeing that converging and changing. And without doubt, as we look forward a few years, organizations are going to want security risk managed. They're not going to really care whether it's physical, whether it's electronic, whether it's digital or cyber. And we need to really look at how we cross-skill, upskill, and get integrated solutions. There were other things that were quite important, you know, market education and looking at disruptions that are coming. There are things that are consistently coming from a technological perspective, and we highlighted a few mega trends that we're seeing happening in other places. We did note, however, that there, there was initially a bit of concern among, let's say, more traditional security providers that technology may be a hindering block for manpower. Our, our view wasn't that, and we actually think, you know, we'll be a little bit slower to adopt some of these disruptive technologies in Australia, but eventually they will become part and parcel of how we protect people, assets and information. Um, so if I, if I could just pull on that thread, Gav, yeah, why, why do you think that is that Australia will be slower to adopt? So we, we highlighted about five or six reasons in the report to justify that, but things like national inconsistency become a problem. Things like the fact that we are highly unionized and labor driven workforces also become potential challenges. and. To a large degree, the saltwater insulation that Australia has enjoyed for such a long time has created a lot of safety and the perception of safety. But when we look at emerging threats and trends like cyber attacks, like violent extremism, uh, and likely increases in violence and aggression, an area I know you're very, very familiar with, th those sort of things you know, will manifest regardless of the fact that we're an island. And regardless of the fact that you know we have natural geographic protection and it's quite important for us to realize that you know it's not a race to be the most technologically advanced security sector in the world we've already probably lost that but we need to continually move in the right direction because our threat actors in opposition are and if we continue with a siloed based approach we only create more vulnerabilities um, I can segue in and then I'll probably just tag back to Brian. Uh, we, we've spoken a lot about what the industry can do, but we also did divide it up into three key action areas. Those were the industry or the providers of security, that's the regulators, and it's the users of security. There's not one party, and Brian highlighted it as we started, one party alone is not going to be able to do it. And, you know, being real, an industry association like ASIEL which I think Brian has 11 or 12 staff that work for you, are not going to be able to do it alone. It has to be this integrated effort. And, you know, it's one of those things, if we wait too long for things to go wrong, it will literally cost lives and potentially millions, or if not billions of dollars of damage by not actually engaging in a cohesive and integrated way to solve these problems. So there were several things we looked at for, you know, regulators that they could think of doing. Obviously, national consistent standards, client education, market education, enforcement. And that enforcement is not just, you know, on the security guard or the security company or the electronic security provider. It's also on those consumers who are hiring, you know, um, providers who are not licensed, not compliant and definitely not paying award rates. Some action needs to be taken on them, too, because in many cases, you know, that directly a is illegal, but obviously leads to a negative perception of the industry. Uh, so lots of things to do there. And, you know, we, uh, Brian and I recently had a really good interview um, with the chairman, Nick, of the Forum of Australian Security Executives. And we have some incredible risk and security leaders in our different sectors, in our different organisations. We do have exemplars of what good looks like. 
And we, we need them to share that. We need them to help pull the users up too. It's not just something that you can go, hey, AZL fix on your own. Um, there's pretty much uh, a lot more to talk about there, but that's probably the, the big overarching pieces. Um, Brian, you might want to add a few, a few there because I try to just cover as much as I could as quickly as I could. I think it, it comes back to the the overall purpose of the report was to was to basically establish where we need to get to by a certain period of time. So we know it's not going to be a quick journey because, as I say, we've been we've been advocating for consistent national standards, which seems to us fairly logical uh, for 25 years, and we haven't got there. But we we wanted to have a roadmap to say, look, by 2025, you know, we'll have a professionally well trained uh, security workforce. There'll be consistent national standards, high levels of compliance, ethics efficacy in the whole process. That's where we want to get to. So what we really want to do is just work through with the key stakeholders, so government, users, industry, to actually affect that change. Um, and if we can all get on the same on the same page, but it does need some leadership. We will push as hard as we can, but we certainly need government at a state level and particularly at a federal level to to try and draw the draw the different parties together. Uh, so we get to where we want to get to because I think it is in the national interest that we have this resource that is ready for. We've got 2032. We've got the, the you know the Brisbane Olympics coming up. There'll be a huge uh, private security contingent, whether it's the electronic side, the protective security side, the physical security side. We want to make sure there's a capability for that. That might seem 11 odd years away, but that'll come up very fast. So all this, all these uh, events that are coming up, we we will need private security. So. For us, it's yeah, it's how do we collaborate all together to get, you know, better service to customers, you know, more more professional industry, but it it does yeah, it's a as I said earlier, it's a shared responsibility. Everybody needs to be part of the solution. Absolutely. Uh, quick question, just uh, I, I guess from from my perspective, just reflecting upon some of the things you you've both said and. You know, I think back to to 15 years ago. I was I was standing outside a nightclub door with a little bit more hair, and uh, and I I never expected for security to be my career. I thought it was a, a thing I was doing to pay some bills while I was at uni, and uh, but I quickly realised that I loved protecting people, uh, and uh, and I loved the industry and the ethos of 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 doing security. But the the methods for advancement and progression for me personally weren't clear to me at the time. Like, how do you actually do this at a level beyond being an ops manager at a security company like that that's about where the uh the, the natural progression finished um from my perspective as a guard so what can we do to to empower and to equip uh security providers that are out there that are looking to make this a, a career and to expand their own capabilities within the industry and make that pathway just a little bit more uh you know transparent for them uh brian i might ask you if you've got any thoughts first before i hand to Gav. I think that's probably one of the areas that the industry probably has not been as as good as it should be at doing in terms of setting out clear career pathways. Because, as you say, most people once they once they find their way into security, tend to stay a very long time. So I think that's something that we are develop, developing some strategies now to to try and engage uh, people from an earlier earlier age to look at career uh, as a career prospect security in terms of whether it's the protective security side. Or whether it's the electronic security side, that there are opportunities, exciting opportunities that they can actually get involved. So, I think we've got to I've not sell the sell the profession more, but we we do need to promote it as a as a long-standing career, which is you know which is going to evolve, and it's actually there's some very interesting parts of the industry. So, I think it's something that we need to do. We we need to develop, and I think it's one of the the findings in the report is you know professional certifications is give people a you know, things that they should be working towards as a as a career uh, and I think that's something that uh, we will look to put in place over the next you know 12 to 18 months so, and, and Gary any thoughts from you as, as a you know, as a stakeholder within the industry both as a as a, as a practitioner as an academic as a business owner uh, and as and as someone who uses security services all, all in one what are your thoughts on that question so I, I think as we're seeing you know, the security roles professionalized at the top end of organizations, whether it's CSOs in federal government, whether it's, you know, CSOs in the cyberspace or the converged role looking after both of them, which I think will become more common. You know, th there is a pathway that people, you know, who start off as a CCTV camera installer potentially or a guard 
could work their way up to go, actually, I can build a career of this and I can get into a really high paying position where I'm making a real valid contribution. So I, th I think, you know, when I started my career, I'm not that old, but I started 25 years ago in this in the sector. If you didn't come from law enforcement or military, it was exceptionally hard to get into the sector. Over the last two decades, we've seen this change a lot, where we've seen people who work their way up through other pathways make it to the top of the industry. So to Brian's point, there is a lot of work to do here. It was one of the recommendations, but the pathways and the importance are probably more important than they've ever been. And you know, we have to move away from this idea of what of, of that a minimum standard is good enough. Having a cert two or three to get a license is is not career progression. And you know, there's a lot of opportunities in embracing existing certifications, creating new ones. But we really try to define that as upskill, reskill, and ongoing professionalization should become a driver for us because the, you know, our opposition are constantly looking at ways to you know, en enact bad things. We need to be making sure that we build our people so that we are ready, capable, and able to prevent these things from happening. Absolutely agree. We've got probably time for one more question, about five minutes left before we head to our networking break. And uh, if you're if you're wondering what the networking break is, we're going to have a half an hour networking break. Uh, there's a link on the online event page to a networking event hosted by our ambassadors, Leanne Close and of course, Jason Brown from TELUS. Um, so make sure you take advantage of that. You never know who you might meet. We've got uh, uh, a lot of people from all over Australia, New Zealand and indeed the world uh, in different security roles. So I highly recommend that everyone participates in the networking. But to close us out, uh, the final question for both of you. Uh, the roadmap has a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of actions, there's a lot of different layers. How much of this do you think is actually achievable by 2025? Gav, I'll go to you first and we'll close with Brian. So I think that does come down to the appetites of those three stakeholder groups we mentioned. You know, I have no doubt, you know, AZL has done the, the, the initial heavy lifting by, doing the, by, by you know, funding the research and getting it done, but it will really depend on the appetite of those different stakeholders. What I would say is that the, you know, the uh, what good looks like statement in the report, where we were hoping, you know, we, we, we could align some sort of guideline for 2025 is quite a, quite a hard stretch, you know, to have an industry that embraces technological innovation, has consistent standards, um, you know, is well respected, well thought of, adaptable, etc. There's quite a few variables there. It, it might be hard to achieve. What I would say is every step we take that makes it better than it is now is a step worth taking. And, you know, this is not going to be a journey where we go, we're here and the destination is there. Once we're there, it's over because the environment, the threats and the situation will change. So what we need to do is be thinking of how do we future proof ourselves, not for a goal like 2025, but into perpetuity as a sector that keeps, you know, Australia, Australians, our economy, our assets, our infrastructure, and our information safe so that we can thrive. Yeah, very well said. And Brian, closing thoughts from you on, on how we go about achieving these goals by 2025 or what we should be realistically aiming for. Well, I mean, as a realist, I think achieving everything on that list is going to be challenging. However, um, I think we can achieve it if, if everybody just uh, agrees to work together. I mean, I think it is, it is so fundamental that we can get consistent uh, uh, security licensing standards. We've achieved it, for example, recently with training standards across the industry. So we can actually achieve if we all just sit down and actually work through the issues. So uh, I'm reasonably optimistic that we can get a good way down the road towards where we need to be. But uh, I think the thing is failure is not really an option because if we don't do it, uh, the, the consequences are going to be fairly catastrophic if we don't have a a security capability to meet future demand, uh, it'll be very challenging because uh, law enforcement and, and the other uh, uh, agencies around the country do not have the resources to do all the, the things that the private security industry does. So it is actually fundamental to the economic uh, uh, operation of the country that security is there, is strong, is professional, it's effective, efficient. So we need to get it right. So uh, we need to find a way to get to that destination. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Brian DeCares, CEO of AZIL, and Dr. Gav Schneider, CEO of Risk2Solution, and also lead researcher at the ASRC. 
Thank you very much for the report. And Brian, thank you very much for making the report available to our PSG attendees. Uh, it's a tremendously valuable document. And uh, if you have anything to do with the industry, either if, if you're part of the industry or you utilize the industry, you contract the industry, make sure you do read that because it's it's informative and it's, and it's directive as to where we need to go in the future. So thank you very much for your time, gentlemen.